Thank you. I, uh, the agenda for today's meeting uh, is going to have uh, uh, three parts. I'm going to do a general update uh, on ARL happenings and uh, assessment activities. Uh, the uh, second part will be uh, some of the latest uh, findings uh, regarding our evaluation of the last library assessment uh, conference and some of the plans we have for the uh, upcoming library assessment conference and Steve Healer, uh, the co-chair of the library assessment conference, will do that part. Steve is sitting over here for those who don't know him. Um, and then there is a third part to today's event uh, that uh, was sparked by uh, interest uh, expressed in the IRLSS discussion list uh, with questions about the IPED uh, Academic Library Survey, the U.S. National Survey uh, that the National Center for Educational Statistics is implementing. Uh, a number of definitional issues um, that you are all struggling with, and um, uh, we have a way to communicate some of this information to them. That part of the discussion will be facilitated by David Larson uh, from the University of Chicago, who will be coming from another meeting that he's attending right now. Thank you. So, um, I don't know how many of you are aware, um, this past year, um, we lost uh, our colleague, Julia Blickstrip. And it has been a great honor to work with Julia. She was going to be at the Library Assessment Conference in Seattle, uh, but she wasn't. She's been at every other Library Assessment Conference. Um, and I think we're still going through understanding what that means for us. Um, I know the ERL board will be discussing what is appropriate to do for, uh, for Julia and Elliot Shore, our executive director, and uh, uh, Sue Bokman, our deputy, uh, will be um, forwarding some ideas to the board. Just be aware that we have ideas about a potential scholarship fund and things like that. So uh, you'll be hearing more uh, from, uh, from us on that. Um, and also, just to say how blessed, really, we all are for having Julia in our lives. Thank you. She always smiled. And, um, um, I always uh, try to open this meeting by giving a sense. We always have some people who are new, and oftentimes they want to ask uh, ARL, okay, uh, I've been to an ACRL meeting, and this is the same thing. And I always try to have a little bit of a sentence there outlining what's the difference between ARL and ACRL. They are two different organizations. Uh, ARL is an institutionally based organization, and our member libraries are 126 um, research libraries in the U.S. and Canada, and uh, our headquarters are in Washington, D.C., and we overlook our wonderful DuPont Circle. Uh, I hope if you are in that area, you'll come to visit the offices at 21 DuPont Circle. Uh, and the membership covers U.S. and Canada, and uh, I'm really glad uh, we have with us today more than one uh, ARL director, Bob Fox. He's the chair of the Statistics and Assessment Committee, and he's always been here at our meeting. Uh, but uh, we also have with us today Martha Whitehead from Queen's University. And am I missing any other ARL directors? I haven't been there. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, it's actually good to have uh, uh, Martha here because I, I am talking a little bit about where we are in the strategic thinking and design process. So you may want to, to say a word, a sentence or two. I don't want to put you on the spot on that. So. Okay. 
it'll be, it'll come. Yeah, I have a slide with a frame. I have a slide with a framework there. So, so the typically traditionally historically ARL has focused on strengthening research library performance and influencing the scholarly information environment. And the portfolio Julia was leading had to do with the scholarly uh, information environment. Uh, and it's a very um, vibrant portfolio that, as all of you know, is changing with the scholarly publishing changing. So I can walk you actually through this a little bit more. Right in the middle of this um, picture, it, it talks about the core activities that statistics and assessment is engaged in. It's about describing member characteristics, roles, and contributions. And clearly with a lot of the data we are collecting, that's um, what we are trying to do. And why are we trying to, to do that? So that we can articulate and represent research library interests so that we can advocate that's what it says over there, advocacy. And so that we can monitor our environment. And um, this uh, aims at enabling action uh, that are organized through different membership forums and um, inform and mobilize our member libraries, and also enable institutional responses. So as, for example, uh, we are engaged into, oh, wonderful. I heard, I heard a noise, so it's going to block the sun behind me. Thank you. Very good. So you can actually see that a little better now. Um, so again, a summary of describing ARL role. Uh, we are in transition. One of the major uh, elements of our transition in the office was our big renovation last uh, uh, Christmas, New Year's, uh, for about four weeks, the office was closed. Here you see the before and the after. Um, as part of this sort of um, picture that describes our roles, I was going to mention an example, like the facilities inventory, for example, that we collect as a way of describing what's happening uh, to member libraries. Uh, part of that work has been featured. Uh, the different membership forums we've had, even at the library assessment forum. Um, again, we are trying to find out best practices amongst our member libraries, and that's driving um, the information exchange that uh, we're engaged in. I think beyond our member libraries, though, uh, we are part of the larger university system. We always try to integrate with what the universities are doing. And a part also of our role is to monitor all that environment. Uh, so as an example of how the facilities work, for example, fits in this circle. And you can see that with other aspects. Yeah, we have also a mic here. You cannot hear. There. You can see that with other aspects of um, the ARL agenda. I think I'm trying to do too many things, but it's a, it's a first trying to record it for posterity, trying to project, and trying to block the sun, which was done successfully. So we are in transition. And this was a picture of our renovation. And if you haven't seen on our website, there, is, there are pages about our strategic thinking and design process. It was a series of regional meetings uh, that engaged 300 plus people. There is a report that the membership has vetted, and there is 
a product, an online product, a public that will be publicly available in the coming days. And that's the cover of the report of, uh, that uh, was uh, completed in August. It was discussed in October at the uh, membership, uh, and um, the committees also discussed um, how they see transitioning into this new environment. Part of this report has this framework that is the basis, is the foundation of what we are going to, what we are being called to build upon. And it describes a number of key roles for ARL, the context for research libraries, essential capacities. ARL has always had a very strong advocacy and policy role that maintains and that is maintained as an essential capacity. Assessment has been a key strength of ARL that again is maintained as an essential capacity. Communications and marketing uh, explicitly stated there. We've always, as an association, uh, had a very strong communications uh, element, but it's explicit now as an essential capacity. And in, um, aspects of uh, being an incu incubator, uh, Spark and CNI were examples of um, um, efforts that serve as issue incubators. Of course, our core um, membership is an essential capacity and partnership. We're in an environment where all our member libraries are being called to collaborate more and more uh, with different uh, institutions, and we are also being called to do the same. So beyond our essential capacities, though, what is driving us, I think, into the future are those five areas that uh, have been termed um, as a system of action. And uh, these are ARL initiatives that extend, there are, they are grouped into two areas. ARL initiatives that extend beyond the library context. These are the first three areas. And the last two areas, initiatives that are within our community, more close to the library world. And uh, the Areas that extend beyond our community are expressed as collective collections, the scholarly dissemination engine, libraries that learn, I have to do a lot with business intelligence and analytics. Again, assessment has a strong element there. And in terms of initiatives for, um, that are important within our community, the concept of ARL Academy, Someone asked, am I in the right room? Should I be in the other room? In the other room right now, there are meetings happening related to our diversity and recruitment uh, uh, work. And uh, my colleague, Mark Puente, is um, uh, bringing a number of uh, scholars, young scholars, uh, together um, in a three-day institute. And the last concept of the Innovation Lab, um, where I think like every innovation is to be defined. Uh, so we look forward to, to see what shape that will take. Marcel, since you, you are here and you are a member of the transition team, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. It's really great to have you here. So let's take a little bit of a stock of some of the programs and how they have developed. I thought it's a good time to sort of see where we are now, and that will sort of push us into the future. Uh, ARL historically uh, supported the collection of statistics and the salary survey, I mean, even before ARL got established. But the last 
10 to 15 years, we did experiment with a lot of new measures, development of new measures, and one of them, the light pole, gave us the capability of supporting some technology infrastructure that uh, made the offering of these tools to the library community even beyond um, the ARL membership. Now, while this is happening, we continued to have uh, consulting services of developing um, performance assessment efforts with uh, Jim Self and Steve Hiller uh, traveling to a number of ARL libraries and uh, articulating how uh, assessment activities in those libraries can be um, strengthened as part of that effort, the gathering of um, this community in the form of the library assessment conferences came about starting in 2006 and continuing strong uh, these days. We also experimented with uh, a performance measurement framework called the Balanced Scorecard, which continues to actually be of interest to many ARL libraries and continues to be a way of planning for many ARL libraries. Can I have a show of hands of who's using the Balanced Scorecard framework? in this room. And I, I will name a few of you, Florida State, MIT, Ohio University, Washington University, San Luis, thank you, thank you. And, and we know of at least about 20 ARL libraries that have engaged with this framework and University of Washington had a version of this framework at some point. Um, we've also did some work with scenarios planning. I was mentioning it to a couple of colleagues this morning because they were saying how their organizations are in transition and they need to have conversations about the future of the research library and what that looks like. Uh, and they were not aware of this report that uh, took about a year to formulate where four scenarios about the future of scholarly um, work and how that gets disseminated are presented and the actual final PDF publication has a number of exercises that you can use in your own institution to have discussions about that future and what that means about the library. ARL itself did a collection of profiles, five page narrative descriptions that was a way of moving beyond numbers into providing more context about the changes that are happening in our libraries. I know a group of CIC assessment librarians has expressed interest in updating that work. And I see uh, one of them back there, Ebony, um, who's um, actually brought that idea to the, to the phone call uh, the CIC assessment librarians have. Now, what do we have spent? A lot of our time and energy the last couple of years has been the assessment of special collections and facilities. And some of that uh, you, you've seen through the facilities inventory and we have a form that we are refining a little bit more about collecting special collections stories um, that we'll make available to in the coming weeks. I'm looking at it both our phone calls have been pretty busy uh, with the various agenda items. Now, a couple of other efforts that have happened during this time frame, but have not, you know, they are smaller in scope. The Climate Call effort, which is an internal um, organizational climate and diversity survey. A number of you have actually engaged that protocol. And the Minds for Libraries protocol, which is a way of capturing the perceived value of the downloads uh, that are happening from the various electronic uh, resources and services. And we do have a couple of libraries right now in the room that are using the Minds for Libraries protocol. And I, I see Michael Maciel from Texas A&M shaking his head there. Anyone else that I'm missing right now? A, a couple of other institutions have actually are actively collecting these data now. Um, we did a three-year IMLS grant with the University of Tennessee and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to 
move beyond just tools to identify multiple approaches and multiple ways instead of, you know, people, I think at some point we're feeling prescribing, you know, ARL prescribing like call it climate call or mind for libraries. We wanted to move beyond those confines. And we experimented with the lead value work on developing methods in about six to seven areas um, that are focused on teaching and learning, special collections, information commons. There has been a series of webcasts that has captured that uh, work. And we are actually launching a toolkit that will allow this kind of work, expanding the gathering of information among for different approaches and methods. It will expand that gathering in a more systematic way uh, through this toolkit. Uh, I see it's coming out before May, um, and um, yeah. So what's next? You've seen in the framework the concept of libraries that learn, and that's a very rich concept um, to be defined uh, further, and clearly some of the activities we are currently engaged in uh, will fit there. We have a new uh, exciting opportunity with an upcoming visiting program officer um, who forwarded a proposal to the Statistics and Assessment Committee in October to do a longitudinal analysis of the salary survey. A colleague from uh, Brigham Young University, Queen Galbraith, um, and I want to thank Jeff Bellison who was here and who was on the phone and um, uh, we defined uh, this work and uh, it's, it's about ready to start in the next month or so. Uh, we know that a lot of the data efforts I've mentioned result in service improvements in libraries um, and uh, we try to uh, make space for that to come forward to everybody's attention. Uh, we know data management and data visualization are important. We had a panel at the last library assessment conference where Sarah Murphy, Rachel Wellen, and Jeremy Buller presented on that topic. As a follow-up, we are offering uh, three webcasts this spring, and uh, they are listed on the event flyer that's out there on the table. There is a fourth, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Someone who has a copy of the event flyer says there are four entries for that, uh, for that series of webcasts. The three webcasts are designed to be half-hour webcasts where each one of the people I mentioned present on how they use Tableau uh, for data visualization and data management purposes. And then we have um, a one-hour Q&A session with all three of them to field your questions. So it's, uh, the series of four webcasts in that sense. And uh, last but not least, we have gotten a new grant on institutional repositories and digital collections on the ways to assess those elements. And I do want to say a couple um, more about that grant. We're going to start with a needs assessment. What is the primary purpose served by your institutional repository? We are defining institutional repositories and digital collections in a broad sense, not a specific of software uh, platform. Um, that does present some challenges, uh, but at the same time allows for institutions that have multiple platforms to, to take a broader view of the needs assessment and the assessment that needs to take place for these resources. Oh, I have a quote from Bob Fox. I was on the press release of that grant. <laughs> you want to read it? <laughs> it is critically important for institutions to gain a strong understanding of the value of institutional repositories and digitized materials as these resources represent a large and growing part of the utilization and public awareness of our collections. Uh, some of the initial exploratory work we are doing here 
we're uh, identifying the need for using, uh, how can we use the development of IR as a fundraising tool, for example? Um, how can we market the different collections we have more effectively to the communities that uh, care about them? Because those communities tend to have disciplinary boundaries, for example. Okay. Some of that. I do want to remind uh, that back when we uh, collect, we did the Celebrating Research volume that featured a special collection from each library. At that time, MIT presented as their special collection their institutional repository. This space. So there is a very interesting convergence there. So this is to say we are transforming. Steve, your turn. You have to wear this headpiece. Otherwise, the, the voice is not captured. I know it's not pretty. The only have... <laughs> Let's see. Okay. At least, yeah, if you just don't have that. It's all the time, Mark. Why talk to you just put it in your, uh, I had one out because I wanted my, one of my ears to be free. But you can put it on both ears. Okay. It's just like a little bit, you're muting yourself from this. One more? Yeah, that's what, hey, it feels like you're muting yourself from your screen. And that the mic is on this side. Yeah. Oh, God. This is the important one, the left one. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear myself. <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Teller. I'm at the University of Washington. Um, I've been there a really long time. Um, I hope you all have your um, favorite viewing spots for the Super Bowl game on Sunday. I will, of course, fly back tomorrow because I want to be part of the riot that occurs after we beat the Patriots on Sunday. All right. So, Library Assessment Conference and a look back. you mind if I sit? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, Basically, the goal of the Library Assessment Conference is um, to create and maintain a community of practitioners, assessment practitioners, ones where we can learn from each other and inform each other both in structured and in formal ways. And that's basically it. Um, it grew out of, as, as Martha noted, um, ARL efforts in the earlier part of this millennium, dealing with Lyme fall, as well as the um, effective practical sustainable, no, effective sustainable practical assessment uh, program that uh, Jim Self and I uh, ran. So um, out of these, we saw a need to keep this community engaged and to keep the community growing, not just for the sake of the community, but for the sake of the library and the institution. And of course, I think we've all seen in our institutions a real increase in interest in assessment, uh, particularly dealing with um, learning outcomes assessment, but also in other areas in evaluating the research enterprise, um, making sure that we're doing things as efficiently as possible, and so on. Um, so the conference began in 2006. In 2008, we started our Library Assessment Career Achievement Awards, and this is from the 2014, where the awards went to Jim Self, uh, Joan Stein, um, Brindley Franklin, and Fred Heath, right? Four? Okay. 
And uh, there were the presenters. I tried to wear the same clothing that I did then just to get into the mood. And so I've got the shirt, but it is winter now, so we're in Chicago. So I've got a sweater. Um, this is a slide we showed at the assessment conference. How many of you attended the assessment conference? Wow. Make sure. Yeah. Well, I don't know who to give the discount to the people for the next conference. The people who've already attended, the people who haven't. Well, maybe we can just give them all a discount, Marcia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, it's interesting that the um, participation in the conference has remained relatively stable over the past, um, certainly the past few conferences. But actually, the majority of um, registrants do not come from ARL. ARL is steady since the first conference at between 40 and 47 percent, something like that. Um, so there's a lot happening in other areas of libraries, uh, both in public libraries, other organizations, uh, vendors, and of course through our, our college libraries and community college libraries. So. Um, of course, we want to recognize that and get the full range of assessment that's occurring, particularly in higher education. Uh, you can see that really where people are coming from is pretty stable in terms of U.S., Canadian, foreign. Um, and then depending where the conference is held, that's where we have the greatest number of attendees, which um, yeah, kind of makes sense. You don't need Tableau to do the data visualization on that one. We know it. Um, the conference structure changed dramatically in 2014. This was due to a number of comments we got from the evaluation in 2012. So uh, there was a heavy reliance up until 2014 on more formal academic papers. Um, as you can see there, the totals were around 70 per, per conference, and then dropped down to 38 in uh, 2014. Uh, we reduced the number of posters quite a bit because people said there were too many posters uh, for them to really be able to engage the poster presenters um, and to see all the posters in uh, one poster session. And then we added lightning talks, uh, we've got 58 of those, 56, a couple didn't, uh, weren't able to show, and then panels, uh, which were new. So we added two new categories. Um, we've always had really around six or seven workshops. These are pre- and post-conference workshops. Um, just as a point, uh, you can see the um, number of registrants with assessment in the title was nearly 100 in um, 2014 out of about 600 people attending. So we get the core group, but we're also pleased to get other people who are involved in assessment, who are interested in assessment, who can champion assessment at their institutions. Uh, the theme sessions, um, probably the biggest difference, as Martha mentioned, we had three sessions dealing with data and data visualization. And so that was quite a change. And those were well received um, and obviously played some role in um, uh, using those uh, participants in um, the webinar series. All right, conference rating. I love these charts. This one actually just goes from three to five. Um, uh, but you can see that really for the last three conferences, um, the overall conference rating has been the same. It's been about 4.4. This is from anywhere from 250 to about 280 uh, respondents. Um, that's a pretty good score. I mean, we're, it's okay. We keep making changes. Uh, we, you know, we'd love to be higher. Uh, but I think the uh, stability of that indicates, and of course the increased attendance, indicates the value of the conference to um, those who attend into the broader community. Uh, quality of presentations. Uh, this is kind of interesting. 
So you can see 2012 in, in blue and 2014 in, in red that uh, the plenaries uh, got a lower response. It was almost the bimodal kind of response. Um, people either loved or hated a particular presenter. I wouldn't say hate. Hate is too strong an emotion. Um, but, yeah, there was a lot of, um, you know, some people really liked um, one of the presenters, uh, others didn't like that same presenter, put that in the comments. And so it just goes to show you you can't please all of the people all of the time. That's a Kentuckian who said that song. Well, didn't he say? I don't know. Um, anything else on the quality? Posters went up, which is good. We thought that we'd have higher quality posters, except in lower. Yeah, panels were low, but again, it was a split. There were some panels that got a lot of praise, a lot of positives, and others that didn't. Uh, and this was the first time we did panels, most of which were submitted, but some that we put together. And finally, Lightning Talks got a pretty high response rate as well, so we were pleased with that. Uh, range and usefulness of the presentations. You can see that uh, the lightning talks and the posters, because they actually represented what people were doing at their uh, institutions, um, practical stuff, uh, again, got, got high ratings for, for both of those areas. And then uh, conference um, logistics. Uh, you can see there were some um, substantial changes between 2012 and 14, and that reflects the type of venues that we had. Um, in 2012, there was, prime, there was one primary hotel, but there were a couple of others that were used as well. Lodging got much higher uh, this time around the university. It was a split between uh, hotel space, which is insufficient, and new dorms, uh, en suite and all of that, um, which can be acquired taste for some people. Meeting rooms. We heard a lot about meeting rooms at the conference, a lot of Twitter. Uh, and so there it goes. Meeting, uh, meeting rooms were rated really low, and that's because um, – Partly, we didn't anticipate. We had to guess which rooms would get most more people. And uh, we had a couple of large rooms and a couple of smaller rooms. And it turns out that the lightning talks were the most popular. And so all these people were crammed into what seemed to be an airless room <laughs> on a very warm day and, um, and spilling out in the hallway. So um, the message has been acknowledged. Got that one. Uh, the workshop rooms um, got really high ratings. Uh, we were able to use uh, some of the new active learning classrooms in the undergraduate library, and I think people really enjoyed that. And of course, we spent more time on the reception than we actually did on the program. So we we're pleased to see that uh, the receptions, uh, particularly the post reception and the conference reception, uh, rated higher. In fact, um, holding those outdoors, at least the conference reception, uh, made quite a bit of change from um, Charlottesville, where um, that evening a little further up the coast, uh, Sandy was hitting somewhere um, in the New York area. It was just drizzling and cold in, in Charlottesville. And it was indoors, so, okay. All right, so how could we improve the conference? Um, this, uh, these were comments that were made by people. Uh, we need to have meeting rooms that can handle the number of people appropriate for the, the topic. We have to do a better job of kind of planning where um, we expect to have the maximum numbers or just to have larger meeting rooms so that it really doesn't matter at times. Um, reduce number of presentations. We reduce number of presentations certainly on the, on the paper side quite a bit. 
uh, people still felt for three days there was a hell of a lot going on here, and they weren't able to catch everything. Be more selective on panels. Yeah, we need to do that. I think there's value for panels, but we have to put a little more care into those. In some cases, we may take a more active role in forming panels, particularly ones that are more summative in nature. Um, lodging should be closer to meeting area, particularly one hotel. Um, don't grow the conference any larger. Uh, people felt it was pushing the upper limits um, even then. And uh, folks like keeping the late afternoon hour open. We tried to end at three each day so people could take advantage of getting out and join Seattle in the summer. Um, and our foreign registrants really liked the fact since they were totally jet lagged or whatever that they could just go back and take a nap in the afternoon. So that was good. All right, so moving to 2016, um, we're going to be at the Crystal Gateway Hotel in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, the conference is scheduled October 30th to November 3rd. Um, the 30th and 3rd are workshop days. The conference will be in the 31st, 1st, and 2nd. It was not easy to find a place in Washington, D.C. during that period of time. Everybody had one week open, and that was the week of the election. And um, we, we kind of heard from people that they didn't want to spend um, election away from home, that they wanted to be able to vote if they didn't have absentee voting and so on. Of course, Halloween is also a home thing, too, for some people. So we'll, we'll do something about that. Uh, we do plan to have a, a Halloween party either on the 31st or the, the 1st. So you can dress up as your favorite politician. I just... The election is the following week, so uh, come as your candidate, okay? Statewide candidate, presidential candidate, whatever. Um, format similar to Seattle. The hotel is close to national airports on top of two metro uh, lines to Washington, D.C., and we have 350 rooms, <laughs> so there should be plenty of space uh, for people. Um, just to give you a sense of the meeting rooms, um, you can see that um, the room for the plenary sessions will hold about 600, but we can split that into two, so that's 300. We are, I'm just losing this stuff here. Um, and then we have um, smaller rooms, but those smaller rooms actually can be combined into twice that size. So we have a lot more flexibility with the space than we did last time. And uh, we've appointed a steering committee. And there you can see uh, the names. And um, let me just, you know, we need to get on. Just the preliminary timeline. Um, so the call for proposal, so I put February 10th. It'll be somewhere between late January and mid-February. Um, they'll be due around the beginning of April. Um, submitters will be notified um, towards the end of May. We'll open early registration for the presenters um, and general registration June 15th, and registration closes on September 15th if there is space and we've run out of space every year or so. So uh, just to let you know that um, it's not Arlington, Illinois. It's not Arlington, Washington, um, Washington State. It's Arlington across from Washington, D.C. So we will be in the D.C. area, and people can certainly take advantage of everything that offers. Again, two metro lines right there, uh, very easy to, to get there and back. Any questions? Okay, well, hope to see you there. Any more general questions or um, um, any other issues you may want to, to raise before we go into 
the discussion about iPads. workshop is very successful, they are over the site, they still are interested in having a uh, public library, public library trust, uh, and having a new system. Um, yeah. 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 Go to the any other topic you want to bring before we ask David Larson to help us 
And he's calling Elizabeth will uh let's see those yes, those slight ladies. Thank you, Amy. David Larson and Elizabeth Edwards. Please come to online that's recording the person who speaks. Where do I put it? My ears? Yes. Or, <laughs> both of them? Uh, that's the mic, so that's the most important part, the left one. But yes, it's for both if you want both. It's just one is better if you want to use one of your ears. All right. More Hold it to my mouth. I don't have enough hands here. <laughs> All right. Um, can you hear me? Do I need to talk into this thing? You can David, hear me? we can hear you fine here. Thanks. Perfect. Wonderful. All right. Um, so I'm David Larson. I'm Head of Access Services and Assessment at the University of Chicago Library. Yeah. And um, we're here to talk about the new um, academic libraries component um, as in, that's part of IPES. Um, starting this year, um, I'm just going to hold this near my mouth, I think. Um, starting this year, um, and the NCES um, Academic Library Survey that many of us had been filling out um, has now been integrated into the, um, I can never remember what iPad stands for, that's why I have it out here, Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System iPad as a new component, the Academic Libraries component. <laughs> the big differences are that it's going to be collected annually now each spring instead of every other year. Um, it's required. Any library that, I mean, any university that grants a degree has to fill it out. Um, and um, the data collection is probably coordinated by your academic institution rather than the library. So we're having to work maybe with new people. And it's due in April. Um, none of the questions are optional. So they're telling us if you don't know the number, you should guess. Um, so that's interesting. Um, there are two sections. Um, the first section has to be filled out by everyone. Um, the second one is for any library that has expenditures of more than $100,000. Um, uh, the first section is all about holdings and circulation, um, both physical and digital holdings. Can you see? Oh, here, I'll sit down. Now can you see? No, still. Uh, this is going to break the whole thing, I can tell you. <laughs> what about now? Yay! All right. Sorry, Elizabeth. So, um, first section, I don't know if you can still read this even though I'm not blocking it, um, but it's asking you for um, the number of physical books, the number of databases, well, databases will be digital, um, the number of physical media, library circulation for physical, and then your digital and electronic books, your digital electronic databases, your digital media, and your digital library circulation. The second section, which Elizabeth is showing you, is all about expenditures and interlibrary loan transactions. Um, we're going to focus on section one here, which is where most of the questions have been. Um, the, the, set, the, the section two stuff is uh, a little more adheres to what we're doing for ARL stuff and hasn't, to my knowledge, generated as much controversy. Um, so physical books, um, we're supposed to report all classified catalog volumes include print photographs, musical scores, government documents, and serials, um, but exclude microfilms, it says, not microforms there, maps, and non-print items. When it gets to physical media, we're supposed to do all classified, cataloged audio or visual materials, including sound recordings, motion pictures, video recordings, and graphic materials, but again, we're supposed to exclude, and this time it does say microforms. 
Um, so, you know, one question people have been asking is, are microfilms, microforms counted at all? Um, it sounds like not. Um, and, you know, our map librarians are asking about whether their map stuff is counted at all. Um, are they put into graphic materials? I don't know. Bit of a stretch, but maybe they're not counted. Um, when it comes to physical circulation, um, we're supposed to report um, circulation of physical items from our general and reserve collections include books and media, include both initial checkouts and renewals, and we're supposed to exclude device checkouts unless those devices have books on them and you're using them to circulate books essentially. And then include only interlibrary loan transactions where items are borrowed for users. And that was the thing that I think got me here today because I had no idea what that statement meant um, because I manage interlibrary loan services and when I hear they're borrowed for our users, I think we're talking about borrowing transactions, um, you know, where we're taking things from other libraries for our users. Um, but the whole point of this seems to be to talk about the circulation of your general and reserve collection. So that just seemed really strange. Um, if we go to the next one, yes, there we are. Um, I think that we really have to be thinking about lending transactions here, and I think what the intent is to include only interlibrary loan transactions where items are borrowed by other libraries for their users, essentially. And um, so if that's indeed the case, um, you know, then it's really lending transactions we're talking about. And this seems to be the case when we look at a fact that they provide for us. Let me go to the next one. Um, there's a fact that asks explicitly, if interlibrary loan transactions are included under physical circulation, is this a duplication of data reported under interlibrary loan services? And the answer is, there may be some duplication, but the intent of the two data elements are different. Total physical circulation is a measure of how much the collection is lent out to users while total interlibrary loans and documents provided to other libraries is a measure of how much is lent out to other libraries. The latter can be considered a subset of the former. Um, I don't know if that helps, but it seems to me that they're <laughs> essentially um, agreeing that it's um, lending transactions that we're supposed to count. But I'm still confused because when we go to the definition um, for the interlibrary loan lending in section two, it's telling us to include both returnable and non-returnable items. And that just seems really weird to me to have all of our scans and copies put in um, with our lending transactions as if they're our physical circulation. Um, we did clarify this with the help desk for iPads and essentially that's what they told us to do. So um, I guess that is what we're going to do at Chicago. It just seems um, somewhat strange to me. Um, so if we go to the next slide, it seems to me that what they want us to report is our ARL value for initial circulations plus our reserve circulation plus the renewals that we have plus our interlibrary loan lending of originals and then plus our interlibrary loan lending of copies. If we go to the next one for Chicago, that means what we start out with for ARL, 234,328 circulations, more than doubled when we report this to 594,321. So that's the number we're going to be reporting at Chicago. Um, it uh, is mostly um, renewal transactions. And as I think we all know, we all have different renewal policies. And if we say you have to renew every week, we're going to suddenly increase our circulation an awful lot. And I don't know how meaningful this number is as a point of comparison, but this may be the number that our provosts are more likely to see because it's a university-wide survey. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth to talk about the digital components. Good luck. Okay, now I'm going to see if I can hold this and turn pages and all. Okay, hooray, David's going to turn pages. But you can actually hook it up. Haha, even better. Okay, so I was asked to talk about the digital and electronic books and circulation issues, which are possibly even more difficult than the, the physical volumes. Um, 
digital, digital and electronic resources are not my area of expertise, so much of what I'm going to share with you is shared by our electronic resources librarian who gave us really wonderful detailed notes about exactly how difficult it is to answer these questions for our collections. So for digital and electronic books, the definition is to include both licensed and unlicensed ebooks, to exclude serials, to include government documents, include ebooks that are held locally and accessed remotely, but not to include ebooks that are available as part of the database. Um, so to determine, we've got the definition of how to determine whether your ebooks count as a database or as ebooks. Um, and after a discussion with our electronic resources librarian, one of the challenges that she brought out in this definition is that this excludes those instances where we buy all of the ebooks from a publisher. So the, the digital equivalent of purchasing on approval is now not counted as ebooks in this definition. So there's whole seriously large numbers of titles that we're not going to be able to count as titles because we purchase them in a different way. You can go to the next slide. So then counting your ebooks is also contingent upon how the ebooks are used. So um, depending on your, the number of concurrent users you can have for a title, your, a single ebook could count as one, it could count as 10, it could count as 100. Um, or if you have unlimited users, then you count it as one. So this, this starts to bring to light some of the challenges that we're running into in trying to make sense of how to talk about these ebooks. Going ahead, can go to the next slide. Digital and electronic databases, that's, that's pretty straightforward with that one odd inclusion of ebooks purchased in that particular way. Um, so report the total number of licensed digital electronic databases in your collection. Um, go to the digital media. So digital media, report the total units of downloadable media materials featuring video graphics or sound, including streaming media and graphic materials the library has selected as a part of its collection. Um, again, some some items that we might consider digital media are considered part of the database's number. And then the final very, very tricky one is digital, digital and electronic circulation. Um, the magnitude of this problem was actually first brought to me by Jen Yu, who mentioned it on either the ARLSS listserv or the CIC assessment listserv, saying, like, how in the world are we going to do this? <laughs> um, this is something that we, we struggle with in general, but are struggling to articulate for this, this particular question specifically. So the, the definition, report the total number of times digital and electronic units are checked out from the general and reserve collections. Um, so as I said, this is not my area of expertise, but one of the things that has been made abundantly clear to me as I've become part of the assessment community is that we don't really have an analog for a digital checkout. So, we're starting off with a strange premise. <laughs> we're starting off trying to define something that we as a community accept that we can't really define. Initial, uh, include both initial transactions and renewals. Include transactions for units of digital electronic books and media. Do not count transactions of digital electronic databases. Do not count transactions of VHS, CDs, or DVDs since the transactions of these materials are reported under physical circulation. So, how do we even start to answer this question about digital and electronic circulation? Um, this definition from IPEDS does not mention either of the counter standards that could be used and that at Chicago we're likely to draw on in trying to answer this question. Um, specifically, even if it mentioned counter, it doesn't go into the difference between the different counter standards that are used by different publishers and platforms. So in, in trying to come up with a preliminary answer for Chicago, our electronic resources librarian count, contacted a couple of platforms or publishers to ask how they count use. Um, and so the two standards, as many of you are aware, the BR1 counts use by title, BR2 counts use by section, and section is not standard. Um, so for eBrary, for example, eBrary uses BR2, eBrary counts a page viewed for 10 seconds as a use, but if you download the entire book, that is also one use. So the same equivalent of taking something off a shelf or checking it out for a year is a, still is a single use. Springer also uses BR2 and they count use by chapter, um, or chapter view and download. And then if you download the entire book, that is also counted by chapter. So we have another, it's just sort of impossible to bring those numbers together in a way that's reasonable. 
So I think the question we wanted to bring to this group is how in the world are you answering this question if you have started to think about answering this question? We've looked at our, um, at our books, at our platforms, and determined that about 25% of our platforms and publishers use BR1. The remainder use BR2. We're likely just going to have to footnote this saying, these publishers use this, this standard, these publishers use that standard, and from those two numbers come our, our, our data. So other issues um, that were raised to us are why aren't electronic journals included? They're included in expenditures, which is significant, but they're not included in collections anywhere. Um, additionally, the, the advice on how to handle government documents seems to be contradictory. In one place, you're told to include them, and in another place, you're told to exclude them. Um, we have a, we've included a number of different places to go for help and advice, including directly from iPads, as well as Bob Dugan's very useful LibGuide that includes a lot of crosswalks and other documents showing the transition from the Academic Library Survey into iPads, and also how the iPads definitions match up with or don't other surveys, including ARL and ACRL surveys. We'll pause and see people taking pictures of the slide. Um, so at this point, I think we just want to open it up to questions. Um, yes, yeah, why don't we stay here? <laughs> um, open it up to questions and discussion. So as a number of you have started working on these questions for your institution, how are you approaching the questions of digital and electronic and also the, the circulation questions? 